Well, good afternoon. Welcome to everyone. Appreciate you all coming out. I'm Bill Aker with the Land to Sky Regional Council. I'm Environmental Services Manager, work on a variety of environmental programs. And I also serve as the coordinator of the uh, Regional Clean Air Campaign that we started back in 1998 to increase public awareness of our air quality issues and solutions. And uh, this event today is uh, one of the uh, activities of the Clean Air Campaign. I also serve as the coordinator of the Land of Sky Clean Vehicles Coalition, and I'll talk a little bit more about the coalition and, and what that organization does. Um, Today we are kicking off the ozone pollution forecasting season uh, with this workshop and press conference. Um, as many of you know, the state will begin issuing or, uh, air quality forecasts for ground level ozone pollution, um, I, I guess this weekend. And um, these forecasts can be accessed uh, by logging onto the North Carolina Air Awareness website. Uh, also, you can receive that through various media outlets as well. And Paul Muller uh, with the State Division of Air Quality will be talking a little bit more about the forecast and how they're, how they're developed. Um, as you all know, air quality has been an issue in our region for, for several decades, actually. And um, air pollution can impact our health, our environment, and our economy. So we've got to take proactive measures um, to minimize the impacts of air pollution. As you all know, the, the region is growing. Uh, it's a very popular region. Asheville's a really happening place. Um, people from all over the country tell me they want to move to Asheville, so there will be many more people coming here. And with that growth, uh, there will be more cars and trucks on our roads and more homes and buildings to heat and cool, uh, not to mention all the lawn mowers and weed eaters and blowers and everything else that comes along with it. So as we continue to grow, uh, we need to continue our programs uh, and activities to further reduce emissions from all of these various sources. Um, the good news is that air quality is improving. You hear about that today uh, from some of our air quality experts. And action is being taken by many different groups to address our air quality problems. And um, um, we're very fortunate that they have um, three of our um, air quality experts here in the region, both at the local, state, and federal levels. So at this time, I just want to go around the room and, and do some introductions. And we'll start up here with our media friends. And thank you all so much for being here. You're really the key to getting this information out to the public and to community leaders that can make a difference. So Matt, we'll start with you. Okay. Thanks for being here. Paul Muller, State Division of Air Quality. Okay. Max Tanger, I'm the Public County TV. Thank you so much for being here and taping this for us. Betsy? Okay, great. Again, thanks so much for coming out today. A relatively cold day, uh, but we're very appreciative of you being here. All right, well, I'm going to turn it over to Paul. Paul Muller is the uh, Regional Supervisor of the North Carolina Division of Air Quality Office, Regional Office here in Asheville, and uh, he's going to give us a state perspective on air quality conditions and programs. Paul, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I don't usually get to say good afternoon at this event. It's almost always good morning. Yes, exactly. Okay. I can turn that down. I'm going to be talking about the ozone forecasting. It's going to happen on Easter Sunday is when it will begin. Believe it or not, that's kind of a unique day. But um, ozone is a warm weather pollutant. And we monitor for it from April 1st through the end of October. 
We do not monitor for ozone officially through the winter. And um, in indicating that, the reason we have solar energy at sufficient levels during the summer is the reason we get the formation of ozone. Ozone is O3. Usually when we're breathing, we're breathing O2. But as we have the energy in the air, uh, a reaction occurs, fault organic compounds and nitrogen oxides play a role, and we get the formation of ozone, O3 in the atmosphere. And that third oxygen, you know, mostly we breathe O2, but with O3 the third oxygen will let go. And when it does, it will oxidize what it comes in contact with, which hopefully will not be the lining of your lungs because that can be the issue. It can cause an irritation. So that's why we often warn people who have a breathing problem, such as asthma or bronchitis, to be careful if the ozone concentrations are going up. That's what can cause you to have breathing difficulties. And um, as a result, we do forecasting. They're issued at 3 p.m. every day. First one again will be March 31st, and it will run through the end of September. We don't do forecasting during the month of October because ozone concentrations are pretty stable at that time. And uh, we have meteorologists in Raleigh who do the forecasting, and they talk to other states. They talk to Virginia. They talk to South Carolina. They all come up with what they believe are consistent forecasts for um, all of the southeast areas in touch with, with each other at that time. We also do some forecasting for PM 2.5, fine particles. And we do that year-round, however. We do monitor for PM 2.5 year-round. And I'll touch on some of the fine points. For example, we monitor for ozone, both on ridgetops above 4,000 feet and in valleys below. But we do not monitor for fine particles above 4,000 feet. And we'll discuss that and help make sure you can understand the difference in those two forecasts. And whichever one is the worst one for a given area, that color will be the one which is assigned to that site. We use green, we use yellow, we use orange, and we're so clean here we never do anything beyond orange, which is good. It's a good sign. And uh, we'll look at that. We do forecasting for PM 2.5 year-round, but in general, no. We don't, it's not as big a problem, typically, as ozone is. And here's our color code, our air quality index, the AQI. Green means good, yellow means moderate, and orange means this could be a problem for sensitive people. Now, we're referring again to people who have asthma, bronchitis, those type of problems, because it will be more sensitive to them. And as you can see here along the bottom, if I push this, I hope I have my little red line, we have air quality index of 100, which is right here. This is where we cross over. That is our pollutant standard. So our ambient air quality standard, national ambient air quality standard for ozone is tied into it there and is as is fine particles, okay? That's what we look at and care about. So now we'll take a look and show them to you. Our ambient air quality standard for ozone is 75. If you're at 75 or below on an annual average, then you are attaining the standard. But if you are 76 or higher, you are not. And the way we do that is we do it looking at three years at a time. So we'll look at 2010 through 2012. That's our most recent three-year period. In 2010, at each monitoring site, we go down, take the fourth highest one. 2011, we take the fourth highest one. 2012, we take the fourth highest one. We average those three numbers. And that's the number we compare to the standard of 75. If we can stay below 75, we're good. But if we hit 76 or higher, that's where the problem begins. So you can see here, right here is where we go from a standard of 100 to 101, because we went from 75 to 76. Okay? Similarly, for fine particles, we follow the same process. We get a process and we pretty much use it for everything we can think of. But here, our annual standard is 12. So we have to stay below 12, or a rounding of 12, to be in the green, good area. But we also have four fine particles, unlike for ozone, we have a 24-hour standard. And that magic number is 35. So in order to be at 100, we have to stay at 35 or below on a 24-hour 
reading. And we have. We don't go over 35. It's been a while since we went over 35, which is fortunate for us because fine particles are not fun to breathe. And, uh, but if we do, then we have to go ahead and have an orange reading there. We don't often have orange readings for fine particles. We will tend to have them more frequently for ozone. So now that you have a great understanding of how we do our forecasting and what the colors mean, how do you find out what they are? This is our home page for the Division of Air Quality web page. And ncair.org, ncair.org gets you to this page. And across, there's lots of fun information, of course. So you can read about anything you want. But if you want an air quality forecast, you press on that button right there. And that will take you to this page, OK? And you're looking across the state. And everywhere you're looking that is colored indicates an area where they do a forecast. So of course, here's our valleys area. Here is Charlotte. Here's over here is Raleigh, et cetera. You can go whichever one you want. What's interesting in part about our part of the country, though, is the difference between ridge tops above 4,000 feet and valleys below 4,000 feet. And we do forecasting for ozone for both ridge tops, and there they are right there, and the valleys. So the color of the ridge tops will be marked on that, on the three peaks right here. And everything for the valleys at lower elevations will be marked there, all right? Now, I took this particular forecast on uh, March 20th, and what it indicates is that the forecast for that day for PM 2.5 was green. But some days, we'll have both ozone and PM 2.5 available, and that'll happen soon. March 31st will be the first time, and whichever one is worse will be the one that shows up there, okay? Because we want to make sure people are aware of the biggest risk to them. And what's really helpful, though, is what's down here in the bottom of this page. That's the top half of the web page. And what's down below is this. And you can go through and you can read. Here's the ozone AQI. It will be listed right there. Here's 2.5 AQI. And then here's the overall color code. But if, for example, in the valleys, we had yellow for ozone, then this would turn yellow even if this remained green. Is that confusing enough for everybody? But we're trying to give you a heads up. And so whichever one is worse is going to control the overall color for the valleys. Of course, at the ridge tops, all we have is ozone. But as of uh, Easter Sunday, this will start lighting up, and we'll have some color over here as well. What's interesting, though, is with ridge tops versus valleys, ozone is a... <laughs> formed by solar energy, that's why it's a summertime pollutant. And now that we're getting into the spring, sun is returning, April 1st is getting here, sun rises in the morning, that solar energy can generate reactions to form ozone. We don't have, there is some background ozone, but what we're really seeing is being formed. And as we go into the day at the valley sites, the sun energy is generating the formation of ozone, you're seeing reactions that involve volatile organic compounds and nitrogen oxides. The volatile compounds are, are naturally in the atmosphere, but the NOx we put there. In general, it's a product of any combustion, a power plant, a factory, your car. All have combustion, and they're producing that. So as you get that reaction in the atmosphere then, it will peak mid to late afternoon. That's when we have our highest readings at the valley sites. Okay, and that's the one that will show up then when we look for a fourth highest some year. It's going to be one of those peaks we hit one afternoon. However, at night, we have the formation in the uh, mountains where we get a, a layer of air that forms below the peaks that stick above it. And below that, they're sealing in the air that is down below and it causing that air to move around and bump into trees, bears, us, anything you want it to. And when it does, it stops being ozone. It will go to O2. It will release that third oxygen. Okay, so we see in the mornings here our lowest ozone because that ozone formed the day before had a chance to react and disappear, if you will, go back to its normal state. But above 
the boundary layer here where the peaks stick up. Then we are seeing not much room for the air between the peaks to bump into something. There's not. So it actually peaks in the middle of the night. So our highest concentrations of air in the valleys for ozone are going to be at 3 in the afternoon, for example. But above on the peaks, they're going to be at 3 in the middle of the night. So we have very different numbers and a different pattern for those. And actually then in the morning when the sun comes up and the air below that layer starts to move around, the layer dissipates, that air moves up. It's cleaner because it's been dissipating the ozone through the night. It comes up and mixes with the upper layers in the atmosphere. Its concentration will go down as the lower levels is coming up. So is that confusing enough? <laughs> But it varies, and he, if you're looking at the forecast for ridge tops, you're looking at what's going to be its peak in the night. It will, it will not be its peak in the afternoon, necessarily, if you're going to go hiking at Mount Mitchell. So it's important to have in mind what these forecasts mean and when they're going to occur. But here's where you can get it, the forecast, that is, ncr.org, that's our website. There's a toll-free number. You can sign up to get an email every day. You can go to airnow.gov. That'll be a national referendum on these that is operated by EPA, so you can see other states as well. <clears throat> and even on the Weather Channel, you can now get it. Okay, any questions on the forecasts? Okay, because you can also get what we call real-time air quality data at our monitors. And... Um, this is where we do have continuous 2.5 data. You can access that. If we don't have continuous 2.5 data, you can't. But ozone all does that. And if you go to our website, and you can see here under our monitoring data, current by site. You can click on that, for example, and it's going to take you to this map. <clears throat> then if you want to see something around here, you click on our part of the country, which is always the prettiest anyhow. And it's going to show you a map of monitoring sites. And here it is. And so you can come around. This is a monitor representing the Joyce Kilmer Forest. It's high elevation. Here's one in Bryson City, just outside the park. And you can go on around. Here's Mount Mitchell in Yancey County. So you can check those and click on whichever one you want. You can see down below, some are ozone, some are fine particles. And, uh, but for fun, I chose uh, Bryson City. It is the one site we have where you can see both fine particles and ozone all at the same time. And here's one that I did last week. Of course, you don't see ozone because it's not ozone season yet. But this is the type of information you can grasp, and it's going to tell you what time this information came from. <clears throat> this is based on one hour of data between noon and 1 p.m., and it's telling you the reading. Now, 21.8 is getting up there. It is. That's higher than we typically see at Bryson City. So if you were going to go there and hike in the near future and you were real concerned about fine particles, that should be a bit of a warning. It had been even lower because our, our time, over time, we don't run that high. Okay? And there's other MET data you can look at as well, rain, humidity, etc. But uh, not long from now, there will be another line across here and it's going to be full of ozone data. <laughs> So you can go to these various sites, especially if you're going to go hiking and you want to know what is there right now because I'm heading that direction. So these are the counties that actually get an official forecast, but in my opinion, if you live in these counties or here, it's going to be similar. I'd look at the elevation you're at, but I think that you can go there and get a pretty good idea of what the forecasting is going to be. So how are we doing with ozone? 75 is a magic number, okay? So we, at each of these sites, we took the third highest, the fourth highest reading three years in a row, averaged them out, and here's how we're doing. We're in attainment at each site, every one of them. They're all below 75, which is good. But you can certainly see that our ridgetop sites are higher than our valley sites. And so if the standard is lowered again, the sites that are most likely to bump into a problem for us will be the high elevation sites. And once again, they're doing this at 3 in the morning, you know, which is a little different. But here in our valleys, we're looking pretty good. Bryson's one of the cleanest monitors in the state. 
So we're doing okay there. And here's the uh, look at the progress over time. If you can see, all right, over here we're looking at 1998 through 2000 there. We kind of put a dot in that's kind of an average of all of these, even though we do have differences between ridge tops and valleys. But you can see we went where we, our overall average was over 85 back at that time. And now we have come to here and our average is under 70 every, I mean, overall. All of our valley sites are below 70. And we have a, three of our ridge top sites are bumped on over that. But that's a lot of improvement. We've dropped like 20 ppb on our ozone averages over time. One other one I want to show here, though, is we notice a bump right there. The reason is we lost our 2004 data, and that was a cool, wet summer, one of the cleanest summers we ever had. So when that fell off of our average, we went to 2005 through 7 instead of 4 through 6. The weather does play a role. A nice, cool, wet summer will help hold the numbers down. It's encouraging to me as we have a hot, dry summer like the last couple of years, and then we still did pretty good. Did you have a question? No. OK. So let's go on and look at the fine particles then. Once again, our standard for fine particles is 12 now. It was 15 micrograms per cubic meter for a long time. And last year, EPA lowered it to 12. But fortunately, we're doing pretty good. We're below 10 at all of our sites. They're all nine something. Still interesting to me that spruce pine has come out the lowest because it sits right next to a whole bunch of mines doing feldspar and mica. But here they are looking pretty good. But you can see across the area that we are certainly in attainment and progressing. And here's how it looks over time. We first got this standard in 99. That's when we began monitoring for 2.5. We'd monitor for, monitored for particulates in the past, but not 2.5. And we got some improvement along here. And then we really improved a lot. So let me just back up one step. And that is that ozone is a gas, OK? Fine <coughs> particles are little particles, very small particles. And it's linked to mortality. More people die when the small particle rate is higher. But as we came along through here, that was due to some federal rules that took effect. Uh, some of them came under previous acts where we were trying to improve acid rain, for example, or acid deposition. But as we came along to here then, we kind of leveled off. But in 2002, that is when the legislature passed the Clean Smokestacks Act. And it was about right here that we finally started getting it implemented. And down it came. Because we have SO2 gas coming out when we burn coal. Gets in the atmosphere, it reacts, and it forms particles. It forms ammonium sulfate, ammonium bisulfate, et cetera. And that is what we end up then seeing as fine particles. It also contributes to acid deposition. And it causes hazy gazes as you're looking out at the beautiful scenery here. You're up in Mount Mitchell and there's a lot of sulfate in the air. You don't see as well. But that's what we've done. We've gone from 15 to less than 10. Pretty good. Um, one other item I wanted to touch upon then, if you are curious about how facilities operate, and you've got one near your house and you'd like to know more about it. We just did this, by the way. That's the main reason I'm telling you. Permits. Go to permits and then click on current permits. It will take you to this page. And if you want to look up, for example, a particular Duke Power name or an asphalt plant, they're never popular, you enter it there. And you can see that you can put in the name, the facility ID, or the street address. Or you can also come over and indicate what county it's in. Or you can come and hit county and see everything in that county. If you're interested in <coughs> Avery County, just come and punch it in. Another one we have, whoops, wrong one, is facility size or facility class. Title V's are the biggest ones. Power plants are all Title V. OK, so you can go there and see ones, depending what size you want. But this is an improvement, in my opinion. I'm glad we now have these available. And you can go see permits all you want. Also want to touch on our website that we talk about open burning. If it grew in your property, you can burn it. If it didn't grow there, you can't. No synthetics are ever allowed for open burning. 
And if you're doing land clearing, such as for construction, you, we do allow that because the idea is that this is a one-time affair on this property. You're going to land clear it once and then build. But you have to have 500 feet from any structure not on the site. That's your rule that you have to meet. You can always call us and we'll help you figure that out. My last suggestion then is to help make the air better is to try to reduce your energy consumption and also to try to drive a good clean car because that will help. And here you go. You can go to our website for lots more information or you can call me or send me an email. That would all be fine. Any questions? <laughs> All right, to give us the local perspective on air quality is Ashley Featherstone, Engineering Supervisor with the Western North Carolina Regional Air Quality Agency. And Ashley, thank you so much for being here. And you'll be able to answer that question about monitors in Buncombe County. That's right. Good afternoon, and, and thank you for being here for our annual ozone kickoff event. Uh, the local perspective, uh, we'll start with some basic information about the local air quality program, uh, an explanation of that and what we do. I've got some updated monitoring data where we can talk about the sites and see what our levels are looking at, the Buncombe County Monitor specifically. And then also I have a little bit of information I'd like to share with you about our different education outreach type activities. Some local campaigns that we have going to try to encourage pollution prevention. So we get um, asked a lot about the local air pollution control <coughs> program and how we interact with the state division of air quality and what exactly our role is. And I always try to explain it by saying that air quality in North Carolina is regulated by seven regional offices of the State Division of Air Quality, and then there are also three counties that have their own local program, and we are one of those local programs. And these are here because the Clean Air Act does allow local governments to have their own local regulatory programs if they choose to, but those programs have to be at least as stringent as the state's programs that they operate within. So these local programs have to be approved by the North Carolina Environmental Management Commission and their rules have to be at least as stringent as the state rules. Uh, we do pretty much the same thing in Buncombe County that the State Division of Air Quality does in the other counties. We do the, the permitting and enforcement um, of the air quality regulations. Uh, we also regulate asbestos removal and open burning and we also have monitoring stations where we monitor for fine particles and ozone. And we also do education and outreach and local initiatives. We also have an indoor air quality hotline. So here in Western North Carolina, we are a little bit unique because of our topography. A lot of times in the winter, we'll have temperature inversions which can trap um, air pollution at the surface. And with our topography and our mountains, sometimes the mountains can actually exacerbate these valley inversions. And when we have these stagnant air conditions, we do uh, see problems with pollution building up and not being able to mix, as, as Paul referred to earlier. So any locally generated pollution is a problem at that time. And we do see a lot of transport of other pollution coming in from other areas and that affects us up at the ridge tops and at the valley sites. But what we have found is that on some of the worst air pollution days down in the valleys, those happened under stagnant air conditions, suggesting that a lot of that is our own local pollution in these valleys. Um, it is a little different at the ridge tops where they're more affected by transport, but we always like to point that out because a lot of times we hear from folks that they think all of our pollution comes from Tennessee or, or somewhere else, but we do have a lot of, of our own pollution here as well. So our strategy for reducing ozone concentrations is really built around NOx emissions, and the biggest source of NOx emissions here in Buncombe County are cars and trucks and the power plant, but now that the power plant has put on more controls, we've, we see that cars and trucks are our largest source of NOx emissions. And as Paul uh, explained earlier, we do see that weather, and pa weather patterns excuse me, um, do influence this as well. 
So right now our current um, ozone design value for the Buncombe County Monitor is 68 parts per million and we do have some higher levels um, up at the ridge tops. And EPA is talking about uh, addressing the standard again as we go through the years and more studies are done. EPA continues to reevaluate the standard as they're required to do and they've suggested that they may lower the standard the next time it is addressed and somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, between 60 and 70 parts per billion. So if they do lower it to 70, then we could have a problem here because we are right at 68 and the sites around us up and on the ridge tops are over 70. So this is just a graph that shows our um, design values for Buncombe County, and that is that three-year average of the fourth highest maximum eight-hour average. You can see this is the old ozone standard from 1997, and then this is the 2008 standard of 75. So our air quality has been getting progressively better. And regarding the question about the monitor and where it's sited, I think our monitoring supervisor could better answer that question, but EPA does have guidelines about siting monitors, and they do require on the larger level that high population areas have monitors. Um, when you get to the more, more to the county level where we are, they do have guidelines as far as where monitors should be sited, again, around population, and also depends a little bit on what's around the monitor, for example. Um, if you had an ozone monitor in an area where there are a lot of trees, that could be a problem. There are just a lot of different um, stipulations for what makes a good site, and if you have more questions. I don't know if Paul or Bill might be able to add to what I've said, but I'd be glad to look into it a little further. Do you, no, that's fine. Okay. Um, so again, we're seeing some, some good reductions here. And I'd like to switch gears and show you our fine particulate matter data. Fine particle matter is made up of a lot of different constituents, different um, acids, metals, soil and dust, organic chemicals. And as Paul said, these small particles that are less than 2.5 micrometers are the ones that are the most dangerous because they are the ones that get inhaled deep into your lungs where they can cause a lot of health problems. And we do see increased um, problems and deaths from heart and lung diseases when the fine particle levels are high. And the regional haze, which I think Bill is going to talk about more, is directly linked to the fine particulate matter concentrations in the air. So, you know, that's very important for us because people come to the mountains to enjoy our scenic vistas and when they can't see the mountains because there's so much haze, then, then that is not good for our tourism industry. So. so here's our data for the Buncombe County site, which is at the Board of Education. Um, you can see that, like the state data, we've also got significant improvements. It was 2007 when Progress Energy had the scrubbers operational for a full year. And you can see, you know, right around in here where these levels dropped off. And there have been a lot of other initiatives, too, that I think have played a role. We've got lower sulfur, diesel fuel, and gasoline, and a lot of other federal requirements that are requiring more controls to be put on. But I think that the North Carolina Clean Smoke Stacks Act is, is obviously a huge factor. So. And this is just the data showing our air quality index. Sometimes it's a little bit confusing because we have the air quality index, the forecast that we get each day for the next day. And then we, this data is actually the index for the actual monitored value. So you see here where we had two uh, code orange unhealthy days back in 2012. And you might remember that there were a few more uh, forecasts that were for code orange. There's probably a handful more, but this number is the actual uh, concentration. So sometimes they'll predict code orange, but the level uh, might actually end up being code yellow. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy there. So now I'd like to just switch gears and tell you really briefly what we're up to at the local agency uh, here lately. We've got some new regulations that EPA has issued in the last few years that deal with what they call area sources of air pollution. And these are the smaller sources. 
We've been doing a lot of outreach with these groups to let them know about these rules. There's gas stations, auto body shops, certain types of metal fabricators, uh, plating and polishing operations, and a lot of facilities that don't typically have air permits with us that are having to comply with new rules. And so that's been keeping us busy reaching out to those folks. Also have been doing an idle reduction campaign with the State Division of Air Quality here at the schools. Um, the State Division of Air Quality has provided these signs that say turn off your engine, breathe better, save money. And what we're trying to encourage is parents when they're at the schools picking up the children. Um, obviously they have to idle when they're in the queue, but when a lot of folks get there really early before school gets let out, and we're trying to encourage parents to not idle their vehicle while they're waiting. Um, so we've got uh, signs up at most all the Buncombe County schools. Uh, just recently got the two new schools, um, got signs out to them. I'm not quite sure if those have been put up yet. All the schools of Buncombe County, except for the high schools, should have the signs. And um, City of Asheville, we're still working with them. We've provided signs and are following up uh, to see if those have been put up yet. But the idle reduction campaign, um, the State Division of Air Quality has printed materials and made signs available. You can request signs like this for your business or organization. The campaign focuses around trying to tell people why idling is bad and why, um, why you shouldn't do it, other reasons like saving gas, saving money, trying to dispel some of the myths about idling and let people know that it's actually not good for your car usually. And, and trying to get some of that information out there. There is a good toolkit that another uh, Catawba, Catawba Center for the Environment did um, that has been made available to schools and we've recently gone out and shown that to some folks at the City of Asheville, um, the green team, so we're hopeful that, you know, maybe, maybe they will try a campaign at one of the schools. Ashley? Yes. Just make a comment. Um, in addition to all the work you've done in Asheville, Bunker County, all the schools in Haywood County have signs and they put them up. And some of the schools in Madison and Henderson County, we're not sure exactly what percentage, but mm -hmm. quite a few of them have signs as well. So we hope to continue to expand this program county by county as we move forward. Yes, and if you go on the State Division of Air Quality's website at ncair.org, they have a link for idle reduction down at the bottom. Uh, and you can click on that and see resources. They've got fact sheets and other information. It also shows if you want signs like this for your school or your church or um, your business, it shows who to call to get the signs in the different areas. Um, actually, let's see. I think we provided the signs and they were put up in Buncombe County back around 2010. Um, but the two new schools did not have the signs we found out until recently. And City of Asheville is, um, they have the signs as well, but I don't know if they've gotten theirs up yet. So it's been sort of a gradual process and Buncombe does have, have them. That I know of, Haywood. In this area. No. In this area. Later, yeah. Okay. Just last year we so it's great that we can provide these signs, but we have really limited resources. So when it comes to getting out in the schools and trying to promote the signs, you know, the Division of Air Quality has come up with some great bookmarks that we can provide. And Keith actually took a thousand bookmarks to uh, one of the local schools recently. Um, but it really takes promoting the signs to really see results. And that's something that we aren't quite able to do. We can be a resource for the schools if they're interested, but it really takes the schools getting involved to really promote the program. So hopefully the signs being there, I think that does promote it some, but there's always more work to be done. So. Another campaign we did recently had to do with heating with wood, and we decided to do this back, or I think it was around 2009, 2010, when the stimulus funds were providing energy tax credits for replacing certain <laughs> equipment with more efficient equipment, and one of those was wood stoves. There was a tax credit if you replaced your older, if you upgraded, or actually I think it was just for a new or more efficient wood stove. So what we wanted to do was try to encourage, oops, try to encourage people that heat with wood 
to find out if their stove is an older stove or a newer stove that meets the emi emission standards required by EPA and encourage people to switch out their older stove for the newer stove if they're able and to take advantage of that tax credit which has expired now. Um, but we still have the information on our website about all the benefits of the new stoves. They're cleaner, um, cleaner operating, less creosote, so there's less danger for chimney fires, there's less smoke and, and pollution, and they're also more efficient to operate. They can actually use less wood if they're used correctly. Let's see. So our latest program that we have uh, beyond the wood stoves is we did a gas can swap last year, which was really exciting. Uh, we did this with Buncombe County Solid Waste, and it was in conjunction with um, Household Hazardous Waste Day. And yep, there we go. Thanks, Bill. Oh, it's working again. OK, so basically, um, we partnered with Solid Waste to do the gas can swap. And the newer gas cans are actually have vent-free vent free and spill-proof features that make them more environmentally friendly. And so we were able to get 896 brand new gas cans. And what we did at the landfill uh, during Household Hazardous Waste Day was we took people's old, you know, non-environmentally friendly gas cans, and we exchanged them for a new, more environmentally friendly gas can. And we were required to dispose of the other cans properly because that's the idea of a swap is that you're supposed to be taking an older, dirtier um, piece of equipment and replacing it for a newer, cleaner piece of equipment to get an emissions reduction. Um, so this swap would reduce VOC, particularly um, part of that is benzene emissions by over 3,000 pounds a year. And this funding was paid for by an EPA settlement, so it was not taxpayer money. It was funded by a settlement that EPA negotiated. Uh, so there's a lot of features to these new environmentally friendly gas cans. There's a brochure about it out in the hall if you're interested. But basically, uh, not only are they vent-free, um, they do have some spill reduction features where when you're filling up um, the tank, once the tank is full, it will automatically shut it off. Um, they automatically close when they're not in use, so if you accidentally kicked it over, it won't spill the gas on the ground. And um, what I didn't realize until we did this was that the plastic, when you have a gas can, vapors are literally being emitted through the walls of the plastic can, not just through the vent. And these new cans are thicker plastic, and so they emit about half as much pollution as the, the, old, as the old cans. And what we also found when EPA was doing their air, mobile source air toxics rule, um, they required these new gas cans back around 2006, I think it was, because they found that the highest exposure to benzene um, and for the general public was from indoors in their homes and the source of the benzene exposure in their homes was their gas cans in their attached garages and their crawl spaces. So that's why they required these new gas cans when they came out with the standards for the vehicles at that time. Our other initiative has been uh, diesel retrofits. And we recently got funding from North Carolina Department of Environment and Natural Resources to retrofit another five fire engines with diesel oxidation catalysts. So we're really excited about that. We did a project back in 2010 with seven local fire departments to retrofit 20 of these engines. And now we've got another, an eighth department that has expressed interest, and we will be able to retrofit those engines with diesel oxidation catalysts. And that will reduce the emissions of particulate matter, carbon monoxide, and also hazardous air pollutants. So here's just a little bit more information about diesel retrofits. Um, there are grants from EPA and the State Division of Air Quality. There's lots of different types of technologies, so it just depends on, on you know, the use of the vehicle, what's best for you. And Bill Aker does a lot of um, work with different counties on different projects like this. So uh, there's lots of local resources if anyone's interested. And radon is something that we've also been trying to address. Um, radon is a second leading cause of lung cancer in the United States. 
and Buncombe County has some of the highest levels of radon. I can see we're in the red zone along with uh, Henderson County. These red areas have the highest concentrations in the state. And so every year the state radon program has been providing radon test kits for us to give away to citizens. And we've given quite a lot of those away. And the Southeast U.S. radon meeting is actually going to be held in Asheville this year. It's going to be on April the 9th here. Um, they're trying to get medical professionals, builders, code enforcement officials, planners, um, and anybody that's interested to come to the meeting and learn more about radon. And finally, I just have some tips for reducing um, your pollution that's associated with electricity and vehicles, anything we can do to conserve energy and, and um, drive less or drive cleaner vehicles helps air quality. So, okay, thanks. Thanks, Ashley, great job. Uh, especially want to thank Ashley for her leadership on the idle reduction <coughs> program, working with Keith Bamberger and the school systems here and getting the signs up and, and also uh, the fire truck retrofit project which she took on and uh, the first project was a bit of a challenge, and a lot to learn and, um, but now she's got the process down and she's, she's moving into phase two. So. Uh, hopefully we can continue to retrofit the fire trucks and a lot of the school buses also the local air agency um, took the lead on that several years ago got some federal grants state grants to uh, to retrofit uh, with these diesel oxidation catalysts um, all of the um, school buses here in Buncombe County and then in some of the surrounding counties as well so great work when we talk to people about well, why do you want to go to a national forest or why do you want to go to a national park because people take, you know, uh, their vacation time, they're interested in, uh, you, know, uh, tr you know, traveling with their family, and, and, you know, we have, you know, millions of people visiting our national forests, and usually the number one reason that's cited is because of the scenic views. That's one of the reasons that most people want to visit uh, our national forests. And um, so back in 1977, well, that's a while ago, isn't it? Congress recognized that uh, visibility was important. At that same time, Congress uh, divided up the United States into different areas. Some of them, they said, would have the greatest uh, protection from new sources of air pollution in terms of impacting these areas. Uh, they were wildernesses, they were national parks, they were uh, national wildlife refuges. And these are called class one areas. Now, when you step outside today, that's a class two area, and it does have protection, especially in regards to new sources of air pollution. P Paul and Ashley have talked about the national ambient air quality standards in terms of protecting public's health, but the class one areas in particular, um, Congress recognized that air pollution back in 1977 was causing problems to visibility, and they set at that time a national goal that we would have the prevention of any future uh, visibility impairment in those areas. And the big one is right here that I've underlined, a, a remedying of any existing Im impairment. So that's really where we are right now, even though this was the goal set in 1977. And there's some reasons for, for that, and I'll touch on, I'll touch on those. Um, so these class one areas that occur in North Carolina, um, over on the coast of Swan Quarter, that's a national wildlife refuge. Uh, here uh, we have four others here in western North Carolina. The uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park is managed by the Department of Interior, the, the National Park Service. And then these three wildernesses, Joyce Kilmer, Shining Rock, and Linville Gorge are administered by the USDA Forest Service, which uh, the agency I work for is within the Department of Agriculture. Just to let you know, Joyce Kilmer and, and Linville Gorge both are quite unique in Western North Carolina in that most of Joyce Kilmer and all of Linville Gorge, uh, the trees have never been cut. They've never been harvested. And what I used to tell people is if you were one of the first European settlers that had visited uh, Linville Gorge, what you saw today is what you would have seen back in the, eight, in the 1700s. Unfortunately, that's no longer true because of an introduced insect called the hemlock woolly adelgid, which has really caused devastation in that area. But these are areas that are uh, 
uh, have not been harvested at all. Linville Gorge didn't have any American chestnut, and so pretty much the vegetation was, was, was natural. But we're talking about uh, visibility, and uh, one of the goal that we have is that on the haziest days, we also call these the worst visibility days, that on average, we'll be able to see 73 miles. That's what the goal is. Now, I guess I should tell you that that goal uh, is set to occur by the year 2064. So it's going to be a little while before we actually reach that goal. Now, we also you know, take the data and we talk about the best visibility days. And what's going on with this program called the Regional Haze Program is that the worst days or the haziest days, we want those to improve by 2064. And the days that are classified as the best visibility days now, yes, they may improve slightly, but we don't want them to have any poor. We don't want them to get any hazier. And so we do have times when the visibility is quite good here in Western North Carolina. For example, when a large cold front passes through in January or February, we can have some pretty clear uh, uh, skies and uh, very little haze. So um, we have talked about, and Paul started talking about this, that um, about fine particulate matter. Now, remember, fine particulates are a concern because they can penetrate deep into your lungs. And if you have respiratory problems, it can exacerbate, the, exacerbate those problems. But also, the fine particles can pass through the lungs into your bloodstream, and they can increase the likelihood of uh, heart attacks occurring. Now, those same fine particles that we care about in terms of our health, these same uh, particles, these particles also are responsible for the haziness that we see. So if you think about driving across the Smoky, Mount, uh, uh, Smoky Park Bridge uh, during the summer months, if you try and look at Mount Pisgah, let's say 10 years ago, very, quite often you could not see that uh, Mount Pisgah existed there. But we still have days where you still can't see Mount Pisgah during those times. Um, I would like to say that we've been monitoring quite, uh, quite a while. At one time when the local program also included Haywood County, uh, we worked with them cooperatively to actually set up the first monitoring site at our frying pan site. Uh, that building finally got overrun by mice, and so we finally replaced that building. And what you can see at this building is that there's these stacks. Now Paul talked about one way that monitoring is done for human health is on a 24-hour basis, on a daily basis. And that's the kind of monitor that we have here. Now, these mo this monitoring data that we're collecting cannot be used for human health purposes. Just to let you know, so, that's, so what Paul said, that there's no high elevation PM 2.5 monitoring, that is correct, there's none for, to, in terms of human health. But what we're doing is that we uh, collect samples um, every third day, we have a filter, the air, uh, the pumps pump the air through these nozzles up here and the particles are separated and the finest particles land up on the filter. Then we send our samples to the University of California in Davis and we get the results back in about a year. Because it, the, the analysis that we're doing is very advanced. And what we're looking for on those particles are sulfates, nitrates, organics, soil, and elemental carbon. Now the organics are mainly uh, released from vegetation, is, is what we see. Um, the sulfates, as Paul uh, described, are primarily, it began as sulfur dioxide, a gas, and it goes through a chemical transformation to form these fine particles in the atmosphere. Um, nitrates are mainly from nitrogen oxides, uh, soil, we, of course, can come from agriculture, but if we had, when we look at, for example, the monitoring data down in Florida, um, they will sometimes pick up uh, dust storms that come across the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean from Africa. And rarely we'll pick up uh, African uh, dust uh, on our samples. And elemental carbon, that mainly could, uh, is coming from perhaps diesel vehicles, but also uh, from vegetation burning, wildfires, prescribed fires, uh, land clearing, uh, at, at, at that. <clears throat> and so we've been monitoring for a number of years and we have 
uh, we understand the patterns that are occurring in terms of the types of fine particles that we're measuring. Um, on the y-axis, this is the concentration, and now we have grouped the data into the best days as well as the haziest or the worst days and the annual average. Now when you look at this data, no matter what type of day that we classify uh, the days as, we see the red bars, that is the sulfates, are the primary fine particle that we measure in the atmosphere in rural areas. So most of the visibility impairment that we have is due to sulfur dioxide being released into the atmosphere. And so the controls that we're currently looking at, because remember the goal out in 2064 is to get the natural background, we're focusing on reducing sulfur dioxide so that we will reduce sulfates in the atmosphere. Um, as we reduce sulfates in the atmosphere, then what we would expect is that organics will be the primary fine particle that we measure. Remember the organics are coming from the vegetation, and that's one reason why they call them the Blue Ridge Mountains. So haze is naturally occurring, but it should have a bluish cast to the mountains, not the white veil or the gray veil that we see. So again, I want to emphasize that some haziness is natural in this region, and it should be dominated by organics. Okay, so we're going to ch change uh, perspectives here. The, we uh, had a camera at Richland Balsam. You, uh, folks that are familiar with the Blue Ridge Parkway, this is the highest uh, point um, along the Blue, Blue Ridge Parkway. Uh, we, uh, we actually took this picture three times a day, seven days a week for four years so that we could actually tell everyone that we have haze. And the, from the camera, Cold Mountain as was, is eight miles, was eight miles from that view. Uh, Mount Pisgah, where the TV tower, WLOS TV tower is located, is 14 miles. And then the Black Mountains is about 46 miles. The Black Mountains is where Mount Mitchell is located. And so this was the view that we uh, uh, originally began monitoring. And we can also use this one for modeling. We can try and do simulations uh, in terms of what if we reduce, for example, sulfates in the atmosphere. Well, one of the things that's, you know, I, I've actually heard people uh, say this when I've stopped uh, uh, along the Blue Ridge Parkway, is that the haziness that we're seeing, it's just due to the water vapor. I mean, it gets pretty humid around here sometimes. And in this uh, 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 image here on the left-hand side, was average fine particle mass, that, that was that bar chart that I showed you, in terms of those numbers for the different types of fine particles, with 98% humidity, pretty humid day. So one of the things you can do with models, as I mentioned, is just ask a question. You know, what if we reduce uh, sulfates by 90%? Because they're the primary fine particle in the atmosphere, and still had a high humidity. Okay, so that's going to come up on the right-hand side, so try and guess in your mind what that might look like. Uh-oh. Oops, excuse me, that's me. Did you guess that? Water vapor by itself does not cause visibility impairment. Water vapor with fine particles does. That's how you get the haziness especially for sulfates. The sulfates in a human atmosphere, they actually grow in size. And they are the perfect size to scatter light. That's really what we're seeing with the ha haziness. It's a scattering of the, of, of the sunlight that's going on. And so when you reduce sulfates significantly, you will get significant improvements in visibility. And so it will be necessary to reduce sulfates in the atmosphere in order to attain our national goal of no man-made visibility impairment in the class one areas. Now, you've probably surmised already, if we improve visibility at the class one areas in western North Carolina, visibility is going to be a lot better in Asheville also, as well as throughout western North Carolina. And so, again though, when we're looking at this path, we by the collecting of our data at sites like we have at Frying Pan Mountain, we established a baseline based upon five years of data. And for the worst days, what we uh, 
identified based upon measuring fine particles is that on average, on the worst days, that the visibility is about 14 miles. And remember our goal by 2064 on, for the worst visibility days, we're trying to get to 73 miles. So this is the actual monitoring data uh, that, we're, that we're looking at going back to the year 2000. Okay, the green line here is our goal for 2064. This is the data that we've collected for Shining Rock Wilderness. This is the data that we've collected for Linville Gorge. And we also have results for uh, Joyce Kilmer. And the results are very similar. But what we can see is that um, when we have the, the blue line, blue dash line here, there's not much of a slope to it. But eventually, out here at 2064, it's supposed to meet the green line at, at the top. And what we can see recently is that Oh, look, let me back up one moment. So this is, on an annual basis, you can think of it, this is what we're trying to attain. This would be our reasonable progress to finally reach that goal of the green line by 2064. And recently, what you can see at both of our sites, we've had such improvement in visibility that we're, at, we're, um, we're improving visibility at a greater rate than what we have to in terms of attaining this, uh, uh, the goal by 2064. Okay, so again, though, you know, we're having visibility improvements, which is good news, at a faster rate at this particular time. Okay, so here, again, is our baseline, 2000 to 2004. Here's Cold Mountain. Hopefully you can see that. And here is where we are currently based upon the monitoring data, what I just showed you. So hopefully, and it's always hard in a room like this, you might be able to see a slight improvement. We're at 18 miles now in terms of visibility. Now, let's pay attention to Mount Pisgah here, OK? What I'm going to do, the next slide is just going to reverse the images. We've put the baseline over here. This is our current over there. Notice how it's much harder to see Mount Pisgah compared to the last image. Let me put them side by side. Okay, so this is where we are currently based upon the 2006 through and 2010 data. That is Mount Pisgah there. And here's our baseline from where we started from. So we are starting to see some improvement. And if we look at you know, the 2012 data, whenever it becomes available, I am anticipating that um, we'll continue to increase the number of miles that we can see in terms of, of visibility improvement. And so why is visibility improvement improving? Well, we've talked about this already, or it's been suggested. But certainly, when North Carolina implemented the Clean Smokestacks Act, that has been significant in terms of getting us on a, 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 a path to reduce sulfur dioxide emissions from coal-fired power plants. And we're seeing uh, improvements because, because of that. I think some of the be biggest benefits are, are for Linville Gorge. Uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, recently settled with EPA. They are making major reductions in terms of their uh, emissions of, of sulfur dioxide. One of their f facilities in e uh, eastern Tennessee, they have actually uh, shut down the coal fire uh, units. They, I believe they've been dismantled at this time. And they've gone to natural gas at that particular facility. So their improvements are very important. There's something at the national level called the Clean Air Interstate Rule. And it's still being implemented by all the states. So I haven't really hit on this hard, but I guess I've suggested it, that the, you know, the visibility impairment that we're seeing, yes, most of it is caused from uh, sources in eastern Tennessee as well as western North Carolina. That's why the uh, reductions that were made at the, uh, I guess we'll call it the Duke facility or the Skyland plant, you know, were very important, as well as some other facilities that uh, are along the Piedmont. But also reductions that occur in Georgia and Alabama uh, will also help in terms of improving visibility. Um, there was something called best available retrofit fit technology. That older facilities, when we started implementing uh, the regional haze rules, there were facilities out there that they were grandfathered in. They didn't, hadn't put on 
uh, air pollution control devices. And there was a reason or a logic behind that when, back in 1977, because the thought was is that, okay, we'll allow these older sources to be grandfathered in, but we know someday they're going to have to replace their boilers. They're going to have to make some type of upgrade. And at that time is when they will have to put on pollution control devices. Well, that didn't quite work out. So part of the regional haze rule, we looked at these older facilities and we looked at the economics and we said, what can they put on in terms of best available control technology? And so, for example, uh, Tennessee Eastman uh, up in the Kingsport area was a source identified. That particular source could impact Linville Gorge. They, um, the control technology that was uh, identified, they were supposed to reduce their sulfur dioxide emissions based on that. They recently came back and said, you know, we're just thinking about getting rid of our coal-fired boilers altogether, and we want to go to natural gas. And so, you know, through those, those efforts, they uh, recognized the need for them to make those reductions. Uh, probably the biggest one that's going on recently, besides the economic downturn that uh, occurred, is that there are, uh, especially among the utilities, there's uh, a large number of facilities that are converting from coal to natural gas. And not only is that, you know, at those facilities re significantly reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but of course there's very little sulfur in natural gas. And so, you know, I'm thinking that when we look at the next set of data, we're going to see really large improvements in terms of visibility compared to what I, I showed you. So maybe in a couple of years if I talk to you again, I'll have, you have even better numbers. Um, we do have a, a, a website uh, with the Forest Service Air Program. This is the web address. Um, and we talk about things like how acidification uh, has an impact on the forest. Uh, we have webcams, if you're interested, at Joyce Kelmer, Shining Rock, and Upper Buffaloes out in Missouri if you uh, want, your, get, want to get your fix of what's the, uh, going on in the most current hour. And we also display uh, ozone as well as meteorology data at some of these sites. And with that, is there any questions at all? That's what I have for you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, that is me. Just in case. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Great job as always. Really interesting. Okay. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about vehicles. We've talked a lot, quite a bit about power plants and the emissions that have been made um, at power plants and I think Paul or Ashley may have indicated that at least here in Buncombe County that uh, now that the Skyland generating plant has reduced their emissions so substantially uh, due to the Clean Smokes Act Act that, that um, um, you know, vehicles are a much higher uh, percentage uh, of, the, of the emissions um, here in Buncombe County than they used to be, a much larger percentage. So, so my presentation today, I'm going to focus on, on vehicles and how we can reduce emissions from vehicles. And um, I'm going to talk specifically about the, uh, the Clean Vehicles Coalition and the Clean Cities program that we're a part of and uh, the work of all our stakeholders, the member, members of our coalition, what they're doing here in the region, and be glad to answer any questions as we go along. Uh, listed here on the slide are some of the other folks that are uh, staffing the work of the Clean Vehicles Coalition. Uh, I serve as the coordinator of the coalition. Brian Taylor joined us about two years ago, and uh, over the last year and a half, he's led the effort to, um, to plan for and implement um, our electric vehicles project, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. And Chris Dobbins is our fleet consultant, part-time fleet consultant. He's the former city of Asheville fleet manager, used many of the alternative fuels, advanced technology vehicles while he was with the city, was really our region's champion, very involved, very knowledgeable. And when he retired from the city a couple years ago, we grabbed him and, and put him to work for us uh, part-time, and uh, he just does a great job. So um, we formed the uh, Clean Vehicles Coalition back in 2004 um, to promote the use of alternative fuel vehicles and advanced technology vehicles um, uh, here in the Asheville metropolitan area. And the area that we focus our efforts on is a five county area. So that's Transylvania, Henderson, Haywood, Buncombe, Madison counties. Uh, four of those five counties, the Landis County Regional Council of Governments covers, and then Haywood County is a part of our transportation program and, and several other programs, including the Clean Vehicles Coalition. 
and you can just see the, the organizational structure there. Um, we were approached by we were approached by the uh, head of the state energy office in 2004, and he asked us if we would be interested in pursuing clean cities designation from the U.S. Department of Energy, and um, provided some financial resources to us to to start this whole effort. And um, uh, since then, we've accomplished a lot. And uh, just last summer, we received our Clean Cities designation from the U.S. Department of Energy Clean Cities Program. We became, our region became the 85th designated coalition in the country, and we're real proud of that. So we worked towards this achievement um, over an eight-year period. One reason it took us a little longer than maybe other major metro areas around the country that, are, that have been designated is that we almost, as a region, almost had to start from scratch in terms of uh, getting alternative fuel vehicles in place. Before the, the Department of Energy will designate you as a clean cities, you, your region has to show its commitment towards promoting the use of these fuels and technologies. You have to have a lot of programs, a lot of education and outreach. You have to you have a coalition and a coordinator, and you have to have a lot in place to uh, to meet that uh, that goal. And we're a fairly small urban area, or, or really we're a rural area with one large city. Um, so uh, we only had about a hundred alternative fuel vehicles in the region, and we needed at least 400 to to qualify for designation. Um, now we've got about 1,400 uh, after this eight-year period. So we've we've um, um, accomplished a lot as a group. <clears throat> what, what, is, what is defined as a clean vehicle? Does that involve a hybrid? Or? Well, uh, the Clean Cities program was created back in 1993 when Congress passed the Energy Policy Act, it's known as EPAC, uh, and they wanted to start promoting the use of alternative fuels to, to help reduce petroleum use in the country, help us get off foreign oil. That's DOE's main objective is to get off foreign oil. So in the EPAC, they, ident they identified or defined alternative fuels at that time. And so I'm um, going to flip forward. Um, the, these are the, um, uh, hopefully I've got them all up here. These are the fuels that, that meet the official federal designation of alternative fuels under the Energy Policy Act. So biodiesel, electric vehicles, natural gas, propane, ethanol, and hydrogen. Okay. Um, several years back, the U.S. Department of Energy realized that they weren't going to meet the, the nation's petroleum reduction goals with just promoting these alternative fuels. So what they did is they expanded the portfolio of the Clean Cities program to include other, other fuels or other technologies and programs that, you can, that can reduce uh, petroleum use. Uh, things like idle reduction, uh, vehicle miles travel, DMT reduction, uh, the use of hybrids, gas electric. You don't see hybrids listed up here. The Toyota Prius gas electric, like what I drive, is not considered an alternative fuel vehicle. Really falls into a different category of advanced technology vehicle, okay? So alternative fuel vehicles, advanced technology vehicles, and these other programs are all part of the Clean Cities portfolio. Um, so you can just see what the, uh, the goal of the program is. Um, in addition to reducing petroleum, um, the, most of these fuels um, are, are cleaner, burning, um, help us lower emissions. Uh, also a, a benefit of all of this is job creation. Uh, this is all part of the clean energy economy that is, uh, is creating a lot of jobs in this area and across the country. Uh, so quite a few new jobs, good jobs in, in this particular field. So what's the benefit of being part of this Clean Cities? Um, a lot of networking. Uh, as a coordinator, I interact with the coordinators from all of these uh, other areas that you see here, including people from Honolulu. Uh, we're trying to get a, a meeting in Honolulu, but DOE won't do that. Um, but uh, we do meet around the country, and um, we collaborate a lot. And um, uh, there's some funding opportunities that come through the uh, Department of Energy Clean Cities program. Uh, as a designated coalition, we now get a coalition support grant of $30,000 a year to help uh, support some of our operations. And then a, a tremendous amount of technical assistance. Um, I can pick up the phone or send an email to a technical response service and get answers to just about any question that you might have about fuels and technologies. 
um, and, and can talk to coordinators and DOE officials. And the national labs around the country, NREL, Oak Ridge National Lab is, is a part of this Clean Cities program as well. That's where a lot of the research um, work is being done. So I mentioned uh, these are the fuels, uh, the al alternative fuels. Highlighted the first four. Those are the, f the, the ones that have had the most interest here in the Asheville region. Uh, ethanol, um, E85 ethanol, it's 85% ethanol, 15% gasoline. Has not, is not really caught on here. Uh, it has in the Midwest where they, they grow corn, which they're using to produce ethanol. There's been some controversy about ethanol. Um, we had a couple of state gas stations here using or, or selling 85 ethanol and they've, uh, they've all shut down their pumps for various reasons. But, so we don't have any um, public access uh, or commercial stations uh, to purchase ethanol like other areas. Um, uh, but I think ethanol will, uh, well I, I should say that all of the gasoline you're buying now uh, pretty much has 10% ethanol in it, E10, as, as you see on the gas pumps. Um, but I think as uh, we transition from um, making ethanol with corn um, to using cellulosic uh, forms um, to, to make ethanol, um, there, there are um, uh, many more benefits of using the cellulosic and I think uh, there will be a lot more interest in using ethanol. Hydrogen, um, there are hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. I drove one at one of the conferences about six years ago out in California, uh, really neat but they are so expensive to produce that um, every year you go back to the conference, national conference, and it's 15 years out. You go back the next year, it's still 15 years out. So I don't think we're going to see hydrogen fuel cell vehicles anytime soon um, commercially available at a reasonable price anyway. So some of the benefits of using alternative fuel vehicles are advanced technology vehicles. Um, many of these fuels, including biodiesel now, when that's that's different than it's been in the past, but many of these fuels are cheaper, especially propane, natural gas, but even biodiesel here locally from Blue Ridge Biofuels is, is costing less, um, especially if you're purchasing it directly from them. Energy security, um, every gallon of petroleum uh, that, that we stop using um, is, is helping us uh, meet that goal of getting off of foreign oil, at least foreign oil from some of the countries that don't particularly uh, think much of the United States. And then fewer emissions, um, all, of, all of the fuels pretty much um, uh, reduce emissions and it, and it really varies. I wish I could put one slide up here that showed you, you know, the different pollutants we've been talking about versus the different fuels and there's so, just so much variability um, and things have kind of changed. One thing I'll say, this is a positive thing, but uh, the, the, the gasoline and the diesel fuels have gotten cleaner and the, especially the diesel engines, uh, I think it's starting in 2010, uh, had to be considerably cleaner. So the gas and diesel vehicles that you're buying now, at least in the last couple of years, are, are very, very clean compared to what they were five, ten years ago. So the difference between the alternative fuel vehicles and the conventional vehicles it, it's, it, the emission benefit is, is not as great now as it was just several years ago. But there is still a, a reduction in almost all cases. Just some of the things that we do uh, as part of the Clean Vehicles Coalition. Um, we pull a lot of people together. We do a lot of education and outreach. Uh, we have the vehicles out at um, car shows. Uh, just last week we had the um, Airport Ground Transportation Association National Conference here in downtown Asheville. We had about 10 vehicles on display out in the parking lot showing those off to the, the folks that make decisions about what kind of vehicles are going to operate at airports. So that's the kind of thing that we do, Earth Day events, um, just every opportunity that we can get out to talk to a group or, or show, showcase some of these fuels and, and technologies. Uh, we can sit down with fleet managers, look at their list of vehicles, and help them figure out which of these fuels and technologies are a good fit for their fleet. And uh, the last one, we're, we're um, popular because we help people get state and federal grants to implement their clean vehicle projects. And I'll mention one or two of those as we go through here. But before I really get into a listing or dis discussion of the different alternative fuels and technologies, You've seen some of this already from Ashley's presentation, probably Paul's as well. There are a lot of things that we can do to reduce emissions from vehicles without switching to alternative fuels or hybrids or anything else. Um, just all the alternative modes of transportation that, that we just 
have to get a, you know, a mindset of, of using these things and practicing these things. Telecommuting, I'm working probably on average maybe one day a week at home now. Um, with the technology we have now with cell phones and computers, I mean, it's, it's easy to do that. Um, you know, how close you are to, to work and school. Um, a lot of things you can do. Carpooling. Um, there are new park and ride lots um, in the region uh, that are quite popular. Uh, there was one built in uh, Haywood County in I-40, what, about two years ago, Luba, I guess? The one at the newfound exit. And, uh, um, and it's, it's full almost every day. I go by that one. Um, so a lot of folks are, are carpooling to work, um, reducing emissions and, and saving on fuels. We mentioned idling. Um, and purchasing a fuel-efficient vehicle. You don't buy, have to buy a hybrid. You don't uh, have to have an alternative fuel vehicle. You can go to fueleconomy.gov. That's the website that Oak Ridge National Lab produces for the Department of Energy. You can go in there and compare two or three vehicles side by side. And you can see, you can compare their emissions and their fuel efficiency and different features and cost. It's a, it's a very useful site. So. We want to make the public aware of, of that one particular site that's such a great tool for helping people um, reduce their impact. <coughs> I'm not going to go through all the detail on these slides, um, but um, I'm, I just wanted to touch on a number of the, of the fuels. A lot of interest in our region in biodiesel over the last eight years. Many of you that are from the area know about Blue Ridge Biofuels, local pr biodiesel production. Uh, company uh, started out really small with just a few guys that wanted to make it for themselves, for their own vehicles, and has blossomed into a growing uh, small business. Um, they're down on the riverfront producing biodiesel. And uh, biodiesel is a great, uh, great fuel. And uh, so there's a lot of interest in using it here locally. You can see the listing of just a few of the entities that are using biodiesel. And you can use it in different blends, but B20 is the most popular blend. That's 20% biodiesel, 80% petroleum diesel. <clears throat> Got some fuel cost um, figures down there at the bottom. Uh, these were just updated a week or two ago. So you can see that biodiesel right now is cheaper than, than diesel, especially if you're buying it direct direct from Blue Ridge Biofuels and putting it in your tanks. <coughs> Non-toxic, biodegradable. Talked about Blue Ridge Biofuels. They are making biodiesel not from uh, virgin soy oil like is being done around the country, around the world, but from used cooking oil that they're getting from over 500 restaurants and facilities in the region. And that's the one thing that's limiting their production of making more, is, is having enough of this feedstock. So their big effort right now is to get more of this used cooking oil by various means so they can make more of the fuel and make it available. <coughs> there are eight commercial gas stations in the region. Most of those are here in Buncombe County. We'd like to get more in some of the outlying counties. Plus a number of entities that have their own private fueling sites uh, using biodiesel. The Community Oil Recycling Core Program is an example of the outreach that they're doing right now to get more of this used cooking oil. And Blue Ridge Biofuels would be glad to come and speak to a group uh, about what they're doing. Really exciting project is this F3 initiative, uh, Field to Fryer to Fuel, they're working with the Biltmore State uh, and a number of other entities. Some grant funds have been obtained from the North Carolina Biofuel Center to launch this project. And uh, they're growing, Patrick, what, about 60 acres, 50, 60 acres of canola uh, on the Biltmore Estate right now. And they'll be crushing the seeds and making uh, vegetable oil to be used in restaurants in the area. And then that fuel will be given back to Blue Ridge Biofuels to, to make fuel for, for various vehicles. So um, it's a real exciting project. <clears throat> Natural gas has also been very popular in this area. Um, a lot of strong interest in that. Almost all the use in the eastern part of the U.S. is compressed natural gas. That's what's being used here locally. But liquefied natural gas, LNG, is really starting to catch on, especially for uh, tractor trailers. Uh, there are companies called like Clean Energy and others that are putting LNG fueling facilities around the country. And we, we just Friday, um, Chris and I are coming back from Raleigh and, and saw the first LNG fueling uh, facility um, down in the Piedmont on I-40, uh, the Haw River exit, um, that's uh, about to go into operation. 
So uh, that's going to be uh, utilized pretty heavily by, uh, by tractor trailers moving forward because of the low cost of natural gas. <clears throat> Again, I'm not going to go into all the detail here. AT&T here in Asheville, about two years ago, they uh, deployed 16 natural gas vans. Uh, you'll see them going all over. It says green technology on the, on the door and on the back. Uh, those are the ones running on natural gas. <clears throat> Um, you can see why it's so, so popular with the fuel cost. Um, tremendous savings on the fuel. However, to convert or purchase a natural gas vehicle, it can be quite expensive. So um, a lot of the entities that have switched have tapped into state and federal grants with our help to convert their fleets. The, um, this is a street sweeper that was purchased last year by the city of Hendersonville. And uh, to purchase a natural gas sweeper, it's about $30,000 extra. Um, these are expensive vehicles, but and an extra 30000 to buy the natural gas engine in there, and the grant paid for that. And um, they bought two dump trucks and a recycling truck and uh, a, a pickup as well. <clears throat> we are very fortunate to have uh, already three public access natural gas stations in the region. Chris opened the first one in the region in 2005, the city of Asheville downtown. Uh, Alltech Eco and a, a CNG vehicle co conversion company uh, down in Arden opened the second one. And then last year, Megan in Henderson County opened uh, Henderson County uh, public access station. The city of Hendersonville uses that uh, as well as several others. And as we speak, PSNC, our natural gas provider utility here in the region, is building our fourth public access. There are some entire states that don't have public access CNG f facilities. In little old Asheville region, Howard has three with one more coming online very soon. So um, we've had a lot of interest here and been fortunate to tap into some of the uh, state and federal funds. One big pot of federal funding that uh, we've tapped into in the last three years is the uh, Department of Energy Clean Cities Program. Uh, this is part of the stimulus program. They had $300 million to give out projects around the country. And um, we partnered with a number of clean cities coalitions and other groups in North and South Carolina for a $12 million uh, application that was funded. And um, uh, so there's 40 projects over North and South Carolina of various types that were funded under this Carolina Blue Skies project. And a million, a little over a million of that 12 came here to the Asheville region for four projects, Hendersonville, Henderson County, Asheville, and Mission Hospital. Those are all natural gas vehicles. 37 vehicles were deployed, and two of the existing stations were up, upgraded or expanded for additional capacity. Propane also uh, kind of started out slow in our region. Uh, there was very little interest in it, in part because we didn't have any fleets really using it, and we didn't have any success stories. But um, because of the low cost of propane, it's similar in price to natural gas. You know, you're looking to save a dollar to two dollars a gallon by using these fuels. So that's getting a lot of interest. But now we have success stories in our region as well, which I'll touch on in just a second. Um, and one of them actually is, is in the photograph. The Biltmore State converted two vehicles about a year ago to propane. And uh, they're in the process of converting more because they're very happy with the project. I guess our first uh, success story, I'll just go ahead and tell you about that. It's on the next slide. The first success story was Mountain Mobility, the Buncombe County Transportation uh, Program here. Converted 10 vehicles, vans, to propane about two years ago and are very, very happy. They've pursued additional grant opportunities to expand that. Um, and there's, they've gotten a lot of a great press, PR, uh, because of the success of that. They're also, they also have 12 natural gas uh, shuttle buses. So they've really, I think, over half of their fleet now is in, their, in, in alternative fuels. But uh, they were our first real propane success story. And, um, and because of that, other people started paying attention and, and wanting to try propane as well. Propane is much easier to get into cost-wise. The vehicles are, it's less expensive to convert. And the fueling infrastructure is considerably cheaper than natural gas and can be installed fairly quickly within probably a week or two. You can have a fueling pump like this one at Mount Mobility in versus building a natural gas station, which is quite expensive and involved. <clears throat> and my photograph never shows up on this slide. I've got to get that fixed. Um, 
I mentioned Mount Mobility. Uh, they won a Clean Air Excellence Award last year from the local air, air agency for their work. And also last year, uh, the Bunker County Sheriff's Department tapped into some federal funds and converted 10 uh, Ford Crown Victorias to propane. They are very, very happy. Uh, Buncombe Sheriff Van Duncan spoke at an event we had last year on propane and said he wanted his personal vehicle or his, his uh, vehicle assigned to him converted next. Um, I mentioned the Biltmore Estate as well. And we have a conversion facility, German Motor Works. I guess the hot technology or fuel right now or the last couple of years has been electric vehicles. We've had these low speed little neighborhood electric vehicles, little gym vehicles you see downtown Asheville and on college campuses for years. But now the high speed electric uh, vehicles are being rolled out by the auto manufacturers, um, especially the Nissan Leaf up, upper right and the Chevy Volt upper left. And many more of these are coming out over the next few years. <clears throat> So um, just a good comparison of the different types of plug-in electric vehicles. There's really two different types. The, um, go ahead and put all the information up here so you can see it. Um, the Nissan LEAF is a pure electric vehicle. It does not have a gasoline tank, gasoline motor, runs only on electric, no tailpipe emissions. You can see the range there. You can see the cost. They are fairly expensive right now, but there is a federal tax credit that brings that down significantly. So when you run out of power in an all-electric vehicle, a battery electric vehicle, they're called, um, you're out of power. So you need, you need charging access. Um, the Chevy Volt is a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. It's just like a Toyota Prius or whatever. It's, it's, it's still got a gas tank, gas um, engine, but it's also got a battery and electric motor. And um, what, what's unique about this is you plug in, you re recharge your batteries, and you run on electric for about 35 or 40 miles to maximize your electric use, reduce your emissions. But then it's, it's got this gas tank and generator that can continue recharging the battery, and you can continue running uh, as an electric drive vehicle. Um, so you don't have the range anxiety issues with the plug-ins. Again, the cost is up there. There is a major effort underway. The, the Obama administration is, is putting millions of dollars into battery research and research to make these vehicles more efficient. I think their goal is within 10 years to have the cost of these electric drive vehicles down to, to what a conventional vehicle is. That's the major push right now. <clears throat> so uh, we have an electric vehicles committee, and Brian Taylor and that group have been meeting for the last uh, year or two. And getting our region ready for the rollout. We're basically trying to get charging stations in place, do the education and outreach that needs to be done to make the transition to these vehicles as easy as possible. You can see some of the dealerships, the Chevy and Nissan dealerships that are selling uh, the EVs or PEVs in the area. City of Asheville last year bought this Chevy Volt for their police department. We had that out at the conference, uh, the Ground Transport Conference last week, as well as a, as a LEAF. We've got about 70 to 100 electric vehicles in the region. Uh, fairly small number, but it is growing <clears throat> pretty significantly. We have worked with a group in Raleigh called Advanced Energy uh, and some other entities to obtain some grant funds to put in some charging stations, start building this network of charging stations. So we've got about 40 charging cords at over 20 locations in the region. You can see some of the sites there on the map including in the, in, uh, there in the map a little inset of the, uh, the uh, uh, solar integrated charging station that BioWheels now called Brightfields Transportation Solution and have um, installed three or four of those across the region, including one in our parking lot, <clears throat> which uh, basically they're running, you're driving on sunshine because you're generating solar power to offset the, the power you pull off the grid. These are just some of the entities that are working with the group. I'm not going to go into all the detail, but you've got three different levels, um, speeds of charging, and uh, the cost varies considerably. Most of the charging is going to be done at ho home at night. That's when they want people to, to, uh, to charge when there's more capacity on, on the grid. Uh, but there still is a need for these charging stations out in the community uh, to make people more comfortable with this technology and to transition to it. These are some projections. Um, from a national group that, that tracks this sort of thing and the growth of the vehicles and the, the charging stations and what's projected for our region. <clears throat> 
We were part of a group last year that received a Department of Energy Electric Vehicles uh, Readiness Grant, a $500,000 grant um, that was awarded to the Central Line of Council of Governments. And uh, those funds were used to develop a statewide plan for, for getting ready for electric vehicles and four regional plans, including one for the Asheville region that we developed here locally. And those plans were just released in the last couple of weeks and uh, are on the various websites that you can go to. And I've got copies of the uh, executive summary out on the table. <clears throat> so this shows some of the growth in the use of alternative fuels and some of these technologies uh, here in the five county region. I haven't had a chance to update this one yet. We just did the inventory of vehicles and fuels used for 2012 calendar year. And we have already exceeded the, what was projected for 2013 of, looks like about two, excuse me, 660 or so. For 2012, uh, we were up to 770,000 gallons. Um, so uh, quite a bit of growth and uh, we're real pleased with that. So that's, that's the end of my presentation, and here's our contacts. We have a relatively new website uh, that has a lot of information on these fuels and technologies that you can go to, a lot of links to other organizations that are involved in it. And with that, I'll take any questions you might have. I, I think one message is that air quality is improving um, over the last 10 years or so. Uh, due to uh, many of the actions that have, that have been taken, the North Carolina Clean Smokestacks Act was landmark environmental legislation. A lot of parties, including the utilities, came together and agreed to that legislation. And what are we seeing? 70 to 80, 90 percent reduction in, in pollutants at the power plants here in North Carolina. So North Carolina is a leader uh, among states, probably nationwide, but definitely in the southeast in terms of the emission reductions that the state took the initiative and, and put in place. Mm -hmm.